Hi folks, my name is Ken Hovind. I was a high school science teacher 15 years, and I love studying about the Bible and what the Bible teaches in regard to science. Uh, I am sincerely concerned about anyone that was taught science by Ken Hovind. Today, he's going to be giving us several reasons as to why the Earth is young rather than billions of years old. And I gotta tell you, I think I'm going to need some help on this one today. If y'all want to fuck around and find out what well dick enthusiast Ken Hovind's six best pieces of evidence that prove a young Earth are, then please stay tuned. What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. <sighs> you know, Kent Hovind's a lot to take, and I just don't think that I can take this kind of video from Kent today, at least not completely. So I've enlisted some help from my friend, AJ. Hello. Thank you so much to Godless Engineer for agreeing to do this collaboration with me. I know that trying to tackle a Kent Hovind video by yourself can cause migraines from all the face bombs. So having somebody to help you with it is definitely advisable. But my YouTube channel is Atheist Junior. You can just call me AJ. And I also am on Twitter at, at Atheist Jr. I'm going to start off with Kent's bullshit today, and then AJ will step in when I just can't handle it anymore. All right, so what's the first bullshit piece of evidence? God said very clearly that he made everything in six days. Now, how could you show the age of the earth? Well, I think the very best evidence of what some people call a young earth is God said he did it in six days and nothing died until Adam sinned. And Jesus said that was the beginning of the creation. So the best evidence of a young earth is the Bible. Um, what? The Bible is the claim that the earth is young in this particular context. That means that it can't be the evidence for the earth being young because it is the source of the claim. Considering this, we have to see if we have any facts that already refute this idea. Fortunately for us, we have a lot of counter evidence that definitely refutes the idea that the earth is young. I'm planning on sprinkling in the counter evidence to all of Kent Hovind's claims throughout this particular video. So first off, what we're gonna start off with is Radiometric dating. Radiometric dating uses the half-lives of element isotopes in specific situations in order to tell how long something has been around. The reason why we can use these isotopes as like a clock is the decay rate from the original element to the daughter element is constant. And that makes these isotopes very good timekeepers. Typically, when we're looking to radiometrically date some sample, we'll want to choose a dating method or a set of isotopes where one of the isotopes, the daughter isotope, is going to be hardly present at all whenever the sample forms. For instance, in order to date lava flows, we would use potassium argon date. This is due to the fact that the lava would consume or engulf, you know, plant life. They would have these potassium isotopes. There would be no argon isotopes in this uh, plant matter because argon is a gas. Whenever these potassium isotopes degrade into argon isotopes, it could only ever be because the potassium degraded into argon. And from there, we can determine how long ago it was that this lava flow happened. Another radiometric dating method is uranium lead dating that we use on zircon crystal. We use uranium lead because the zircon crystalline structure is very easily accepting of uranium atoms, while at the same time, lead is not incorporated into their crystalline structure. So any lead that appears in zircon crystals can only ever be because of uranium degrading into lead. In uranium lead dating, we generally use two different types of uranium and lead isotopes. The half-lives of both of these isotopes are about 700 million years and about 4 billion years. Currently, the oldest zircon crystal that we have is over 4 billion years old. The fact that this crystal and lead in general exists means that the earth is definitely older than 6,000 years. You may be wondering what Kent would say to this piece of evidence. Typically, creationists will respond with these papers that are generated by 
creation scientists that attempt to show a flaw in the radiometric dating method. They end up misusing the method in order to show that it doesn't work. It would be like using a hammer to smash a car window in order to open up the car door and then proclaiming that this is a silly and broken way in order to open up a car door. They have to misuse the tool in order to disprove the tool, which makes them dishonest. Another very special way to combat this piece of evidence is to specially plead for the physics prior to the flood. They just say that stuff worked differently at that time. Keep in mind that there's no evidence for this whatsoever, but they just want to presuppose that God does exist and so therefore he could create anything in any kind of way that he wanted to. But the important point is, is that Kent can't overcome this counter evidence to his claim. Therefore, the Bible doesn't comport with reality in this particular context, so we can't really expect it to give us any kind of good information about reality. Suggesting that the Bible is the best proof, while every piece of evidence that we have points away from the Bible, is just irrational. The Bible, certainly the dates in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, clearly add up to about 6,000 years for the total age of the earth, 4,000 BC. That's never been refuted. What he means here is that if you count up the lifetimes of specific people in the Bible, you end up with a 6,000 year timeline. The problem is, is that people in the Bible live unnaturally long. I believe Adam died when he was about 930 years old, and Noah, he died when he was like 950. This defies all known biological science about how our bodies work. Of course, Kent would say that these were pure-blooded humans, whatever in the Aryan fuck that would mean. So they obviously could live longer lives. More importantly, this is just pure speculation on Kent's part. He requires you to presuppose that our bodies worked differently or we were genetically different at the beginning of time than we are now. And he never does anything to prove this claim. He just presupposes it. It kind of seems like every single time they attempt to counter evidence that disproves their claim, they just have to presuppose more bullshit without any kind of evidence to back it up. In any case, another piece of evidence that refutes this notion that the Earth is young is just simply the fossil record. The fossil record dates back billions of years and is nearly impossible to overcome in this context. The fossil record also squashes this notion that humans have been on this Earth since the Earth formed. Homo sapiens have only appeared in the fossil record for the last few hundred thousand years, which is obviously much older than Kent's idea of a 6,000 year old Earth. Some people don't want to believe that, but the best evidence I think of what they call, I don't think 6,000 is young, I think that's pretty old, but the best evidence of a 6,000 year old Earth is the Bible itself. I still do not understand why Kent thinks this other than he thinks that God literally penned the Bible with his own lightning dick and therefore is an eyewitness to it all? It's kind of weird how God created everything in the way that it exists now, but yet he created it in such a way so that everything makes it seem very old. It's either that or God really didn't create anything and shit's just old. Oh. Another thing that disproves this whole young Earth idea is the speed of light. The speed of light in a vacuum is constant. Given that generally in space there's nothing to slow down light unless that light hits another object, this means that most of the stars that we see in the sky we probably shouldn't actually see if the Earth is 6,000 years old. But then you can look at almost any branch of science. You can look at the, the science of living things, biology, and you'll see that the population of the Earth today is growing, but if you can do the math and go backwards in time, you can make everybody on the planet from eight people getting off of Noah's Ark 4,500 years ago. <laughs> this simply cannot be true. The thing that he's ignoring here is called the Minimum Viable Population, or the MVP. Typically, the MVP for any group of organisms follows the 5500 rule. The 5500 rule says that you need about 50 individuals in order to stave off genetic defects caused by inbreeding. And then you would need 500 individuals in order to 
prevent the genetic bottleneck that is caused by genetic drift. For humans, though, the MVP is typically calculated to be between 2,500 and 5,000 individuals. This would effectively give you 500 individuals that can provide the genetic diversity needed to sustain a large group of people. Those numbers are what you would need to populate a world, let's say not eight. Another peculiar thing here is that he also thinks that population growth is exponential and always increasing. He doesn't take into account like worldwide disasters or any of the various wars that our species has been through. Population growth is not exponential, but it has to be consistently exponential for Kent's idea to work. Hey, heathens, uh, future GE here. I just wanted to be a bit more explicit about this particular section of the video. Um, I get how what I said came off as uh, maybe somewhat slightly incorrect because population growth can definitely be uh, exponential. Like, for instance, in the case of bacteria, you experience exponential growth while resources are unlimited, at least seemingly unlimited. But uh, what I was talking about was explicitly consistent exponential growth over long periods of time. That kind of growth is not what happens uh, at all. The population growth is limited by a number of factors, including like uh, worldwide uh, pandemics, wars, uh, anything else that would limit our population growth, but also by the resources that we have at that time. So while exponential growth does happen, Generally speaking, exponential growth is not how you would describe the growth of a population in general. If man's been here for millions of years, why aren't there a whole lot more people? Population is a great indicator that man has not been here for millions of years. <laughs> there are 8 billion people on this planet. How much more does Kent think there should be? Of course, he's still operating under the assumption that population growth is exponential and always increasing. So he's really only judging the current population by his straw man standards. Also, another thing to note here is that Homo sapiens, which is what he means when he says man, hasn't been around for millions of years. Homo sapiens have only been around for the past few hundreds of thousands of years. So not only is he inappropriately judging the population growth of humans, but he is also suggesting that we say that humans have been around for millions of years. The Earth has been around for billions of years, and organisms have been on this planet for billions of years. That doesn't mean that humans have been here that whole time. The thing is, at least I think, in my own opinion, is that Kent literally can't be honest about either his position or our position, because if he is, then his entire argument falls apart. When you look at the genetic load that's increasing in the gene pool of people, you say, wow, this can't have been going on for a long time not millions of years. What? This is a genetic load of shit. I would need a citation on what he thinks our genetic load is, which would be the buildup of deleterious mutations. You know what doesn't make sense for Kent? The fact that genetics doesn't support his idea of the entire world being populated by two or eight people. You simply cannot sister brother fuck your way into an entire world population. But again, he has to ignore the reality of his claim in order to make his claim work. Or I guess he just specially pleads his way into it by suggesting that our genetics worked completely differently before either the fall or the flood or whatever particular point in time you want to pick out. He thinks the, ori the original humans had a genetically perfect code, whatever in the Nazi love and fuck that is. You know, I just, I can't take it anymore. I realize that I'm, I'm cursing a lot and this is just a natural side effect of too much exposure to Kent Hovind. So I'm just going to let AJ take it from here. AJ, can you help me out? So yeah, I'm going to be tackling the final three evidences of creationism. So we're going to start with the shrinking sun. You can look at the sun. The sun is burning up its fuel source. So Kent always says that the sun is burning off its fuel, but this really isn't accurate. The sun is taking hydrogen 
and changing it into helium through nuclear fusion in its core. The helium has less mass than the original hydrogen, and it releases this extra mass as energy. You know, E equals mc squared? This doesn't cause the sun to shrink. It actually is making it expand. And the sun contains 99% of the mass in our solar system. So even over its entire lifespan, the mass it's lost is negligible. The sun is losing about 6 times 10 to the 12th power grams per second, and it has a mass of 2 times 10 to the 33rd grams. So the fraction of mass it loses every year is about 10 to the negative 13th power. The Earth's orbit is 150 kilometers, and if you multiply that by 10 to the negative 13th power, you get about 1.5 centimeters. That's how much bigger the Earth's orbit gets every year, less than an inch. It would take about 65,000 years for the Earth to move away one kilometer. I can walk that far in just a few minutes. Shrinking because of it's burning up its fuel, and it is not only shrinking, it is throwing off 5 million tons a second. It's losing weight. Well, if your sun's been losing weight for billions of years, if you get back in time in your imagination, the sun would be much heavier, making gravity stronger. Gravity isn't affected by weight. It's affected by mass. The more massive two objects are in space, the more space-time is bent, and the stronger the gravitational attraction between the two objects will be. And even if the sun had more mass billions of years ago, that doesn't mean it would suck all of the planets in our solar system in like a giant vacuum cleaner. It just means the orbits of the planets would change a small amount. The habitable zone of Earth, meaning the distance to the sun where we aren't too close and too hot or too far away and too cold, is about 0.9 to 1.2 astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun. Sucking all the planets in. You cannot have the fine balance between Earth and Sun with it just being in the right habitable zone for millions and billions of years while the Sun's losing weight so fast. Why not? Well, you look at the Moon. The Moon's going around the Earth, but the Moon's getting further away from the Earth. Okay? Well, that means it used to be closer. I don't understand why Kent uses this as evidence for his argument, yet if I explain to Kent that we see the universe expanding all around us in every direction, and that if you reverse time, it would mean that eventually the universe would be localized in one point, a singularity, and that that's evidence for the Big Bang, he would reject that, even though it's the same logic. So another double standard that Kent has is he says that uniformitarianism doesn't apply in geology. You know, like the, the present is the key to the past. So why is it that it applies here? How does he know that the recession rate has been a constant? If you bring the moon back in closer, you get higher tides. And at some point, you get too close and they snap together like two magnets, called the inverse square law. You can look at the stars in space, you can look at the living things on Earth, and look at the Earth itself. The Earth is spinning, but it slows down. I give about 30 different scientists. Okay, so at the current recession rate, the moon would have been about 178,000 kilometers or 110,000 freedom units or miles when the Earth was first formed 4.5 billion years ago. That's how close it would be. The recession of the moon is driven by the effect of the moon's gravity on the rotating Earth. Tides raised in the ocean cause drag and thus slow the rate of the Earth's spin. The resulting loss of angular momentum is compensated by the moon speeding up, and the momentum lost by the Earth must be gained by the moon because of the conservation of angular momentum. The momentum lost by the Earth is gained by the moon, and as the moon gains energy, it moves to a higher orbit. So that's why it's receding. And if the moon did get closer to the Earth, they would not snap together like two magnets. That's not how gravity works. There's a phenomenon called the Roche limit. In astronomy, the minimum distance to which a large satellite can approach its primary body without tidal forces overcoming the internal gravity holding the satellite together. So the moon would just be ripped apart in space. Scientific indicators for a young Earth on my seminar part one on drdino.com. But to me, the very best evidence that the Earth is 6,000 years old is exactly what God, who, he's the guy who did it. He said, 
That was the beginning when he made Adam and Eve. Matthew 19, 4, Mark 10, 6. So I would encourage you to read that Bible. Yeah, so God didn't say anything. According to Christian scholars and all Christians, God inspired men to write the Bible. But Kent actually says that God wrote Genesis chapter 1, which even other Christians would probably find ridiculous. Never been disproven. And think about it. Man, this is what it says. Maybe God is right. Maybe the earth is 6,000 years old. That's plenty of time to accomplish everything I know of on the planet if you allow one big flood in there. It's not enough time for radioactive elements to decay because uranium has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. And if you want to take that half-life and have all the uranium on Earth decay in a 6,000-year time span, that would cause so much heat, it would burn up the Earth and destroy it many times over. Not to mention the other radioactive elements. You can't squeeze that half-life into just 6,000 years. It's called the heat problem. And there are other things that are affected by that time scale change. Like we know that geological formations like mountains cannot form in such a short time span. You do need deep time for these things to form. Make the canyons. All right. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you to GE for agreeing to do this collab with me. And I hope you guys will check out my channel and subscribe. I've done collaborations with Paul Ogia. I've done collaborations with Emma Thorne. I've interviewed Aaron Ra, and I recently did an interview with Professor Dave. Um, I do videos on my channel about atheist activism, debunking younger creationists like Kent Hoven and Matt Powell and Josh Feirstein. And I also have some videos reacting to pastors like John Hagee. And I really hope that you guys will check it out. I do live streams a couple times a week, and we have a lot of fun in those streams. So I hope you'll join me for the next one and check out my channel. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I just had to take a breather right there at the end. Thank you so much, AJ. Everybody, I hope that you will go over to AJ's channel and subscribe. He does a lot of great content over there. Definitely go and check out AJ or Atheist Jr. Uh, his stuff will be linked down below as well as my information will be linked down below as well. If you're watching this over on uh, Atheist Jr.'s channel, come on over to my channel. I don't swear as much as I do in this video sometimes. So please come on over to my channel. I do content similar to this as well as other atheist content over there so come on over and check me out well heathens that's gonna be it for the video today if you will please go down below and let me know what you think in the comments do you think that kent had some good pieces of evidence here or do you think it's just all pretty much bullshit let me know in the comments below and hey while you're down there why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of video don't forget to stand up and use your voice bye heathens